All right, everyone, we are seeing people start to trickle in right now. We have opened up the session. So bear with us as we wait a few minutes while we wait for other people to continue to join us. But thank you for coming. We're excited to start this soon. Hello, Jack. And just as a reminder, I know people are still starting to trickle in. Um, we are just holding off a few minutes before we kick things off um, with this first quick takes. Um, we are waiting for other people to continue to join us and we're doing like a little bit of moving around with people in the audience. So um, welcome, we're happy to have you here. But just give us a few minutes and we'll get started. Um, and also just to let you know, I'm gonna say this a couple times, this is a recorded session. Hello, everyone. Just waiting another minute or two to uh, let people in to the webinar, and then we'll get get started. Okay, everyone, I think that we are good to go now. We have um, quite a high attendance today. We are happy to see that the Quick Takes is generating a lot of interest and we welcome you all to this first session. Um, my name is Danielle Reby and my co-host tonight is going to be Sarah McClure over there. Um, we are kind of like your moderators, your MCs for tonight's event. Um, we're also the organizers of it. So um, we kind of have a little bit of history when it comes to the Quick Take series, and we'd like to tell you about it. Um, but just as a note for us moving forward, this is a recorded session, so please bear that in mind. Um, and Sarah's going to talk about the layout of the session or how we're going to proceed later on after I go into the history of it or discuss the history of the Quick Take session. Um, but just to let you know, this uh, forum allows you to ask questions in the Q&A section. So be aware of that. It is in your um, Zoom platform. Um, so yeah, we'll tackle that a little bit later. So the history of quick takes is kind of an interesting one. So um, it all starts with the Coalition for Archaeological Synthesis. And this is a relatively new uh, group, actually, founded in 2017 by Jeffrey um, Altschul and um, Keith Kintig. They 
ultimately we're just looking to create a platform in which to build bridges and create synthesis in archaeology to expand knowledge and basically look at information that might benefit society, not just like understanding the past at large, but also understanding how this could benefit people in the future as well. So with this as their intent, the CFAS reached out to a lot of different organizations um, and they partnered with a lot of different institutions. One of those was the Archaeological Institute of America, hence why we're doing this tonight. The Archaeological Institute of America then started a working group and we call it the AIA CFAS group. And the AIA CFAS group met, oh, I think it was back in 2020 now. So we met for the first time in 2020, Sarah being a member of the working group, myself also included, along with a number of other colleagues of ours. And we discussed ways in which we could present and uh, present different information, present different synthesis or syntheses of information and figure out how the AIA could really help CFAS in their ultimate goals. Um, and one of the ways that we did that, or one of the ways that we discussed doing that was having a workshop um, at uh, one of the AIA meetings. And we decided to do it for the 2021 meetings. And that didn't work out so well. Like the world was kind of in upheaval and we were like, oh, let's put a pause button on it. Let's take a beat. We'll come back, you know, post COVID and figure this all out. And then we realized in 2021 that there will be never a post COVID time. So we needed to figure out a new way in which to work with the AIA, AIA CFAS working group and figure out a way that we can actually benefit all of this. So that's when Sarah and I put our heads together and we developed this idea for quick takes. We wanted to start it off as a lightning round at the 2022 AIA conference in which we um, had different presenters the presenters that you're going to see today, in fact, put together these five minute videos and we were going to present it at this lightning round. Um, and these presenters were all going to tackle a specific topic. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, and with that in mind, we reached out to a bunch of people and asked them to put together these videos. And then, of course, at the last minute, after everybody agreed to do this and submitted their videos, um, you know, the, the conference had to pivot. There was another uptick, another surge of COVID. And what we planned on doing just couldn't be feasibly done at the 2022 conference. And so ever since then, we've been working to get these videos, to get this quick takes uh, uh, session up and running in this virtual platform that you're all in today. So we are very happy to have you all here. We're very excited to have this inaugural quick takes event actually occur. And um, the kind of idea behind quick takes is very similar to that elevator talk. You know how we always are taught to like learn how to give your uh, research interests and your research um, agenda in like two minutes in the elevator, go. But sometimes we forget how to do that. And sometimes it's good to think about like how the research that we're doing relates, relates to people at large, relates to other researchers. And how can we boil down all the different projects, all the research that we're doing in like a little five minute session. That was the challenge that we presented to our specialists today. And they ran with it in a variety of different ways. The topic we decided to tackle as part of the AIA CFAS was um, big data in archeology. span This is an increasing issue that we're dealing with in archeology. span Not only are we dealing with like just an increased amount of archeological data at large because there's more archeological projects going on, more excavations taking place, more research being conducted, but also the ways in which we're investigating the past, they're changing. We have new technologies and we're entering those at large into our research so that we can tease out as much information as possible in order to better reconstruct the past and in order to help the future. So because of this, we see big data as a critical point in archeological research nowadays. And we still need to figure out ways to distill this big data information to the general audience. Again, another reason why we have quick takes. Quick takes allows people to present these little digestible nuggets of information, but you can also bring these pieces, these little clips, these snippets from these researchers into the classroom. You can uh, 
have this information available at a click away on the internet because in perpetuity, these video clips will be housed on the AI website as well as the AIA YouTube channel. So be sure to integrate these as best as you can. And as we proceed with these quick take session or with the quick take session today, please bear in mind that we're looking for new ideas for new quick takes too all the time. I'll pitch this again later. Um, so with that in mind, we have a wonderful session for you and I will let Sarah take it away from here. All right, thank you, Danny, and welcome everyone. We're excited to have this event up and running, uh, even if it's a couple of months later than we originally thought it would be. Um, so the way that we wanted to structure it today is um, that we will be looking at, we will be watching these videos together. Um, I'll, we'll be doing brief introductions about the, um, about the presenters uh, prior to, to their videos. Um, and we welcome questions and comments um, in the Q&A function uh, of this webinar. The Q&A function, rather than the chat, um, allows us to, uh, to um, keep track of questions as they come in. So, you know, your question doesn't get lost in the mix um, if there are other questions that come up afterwards, the way the chat kind of gets all, can get kind of messy. Um, so the Q&A function uh, is our friend in this regard, and I encourage you to use this. Um, we have some of our wonderful panelists with us here today as well. Um, so Jennifer Birch and Dylan Davis and Hannah Lau um, were all available to, uh, to come today. Um, so we're excited to have them with us as well. Um, as Danny mentioned, um, these are short little tastes, little bits. Um, so we hope you have a, a cup of tea or maybe a glass of wine wherever you are, um, or in my case, it's still coffee because it's still early in the afternoon, um, and uh, enjoy the first video or the first of our videos. Um, this first video that we have is um, a video by Sturt Manning from Cornell University. Um, Sturt is a distinguished professor of arts and sciences in classical archaeology at Cornell. He's also the director of the Cornell Tree Ring Laboratory. Um, Sturt has directed numerous projects in Cyprus over the course of his career. And um, his talk today, or his, uh, his quick take today, is titled Resolving Human Associations in History in Large Chronological Data Sets. Hello, I'm Sturt Manning. I work at Cornell University, and I work with tree rings and radiocarbon dates and other other sources of evidence to try and look at climate history and other sources of information. Two examples here of some of the challenges of using big data in these fields. Left-hand side, work from Orkton in Al 2016, in which they put together a vast amount of tree ring, but also other environmental information, speleothems, lake sediments, historical sources, glaciers, etc. And they argue that the sort of matching up various little bars and lines maybe explains the late antique little ice age and the history that they claim comes from this. But although you can see that the big volcano in the 530s, 540s seems to match up with the Emperor Justinian, it seems to match up with the plague that first happened in 541, some of the rest of the you know, climate explains history is not as clear as it seems from such a diagram. The strict temporal and causal associations of most of the other episodes is not so obvious. For example, of the 10 climate change events listed by Bolton et al, only four correlate with the marked very cold intervals in either the European tree ring records of those the Altai Mount, Central Asia, and two fall more or less in between the cold periods. So not necessarily even the correlation to allow a causation discussion. On the right, I give the example of some probability distributions, which are very popular um, creations now from large databases of radiocarbon dates. They're argued to give us demographic histories of regions, which enable us to compare that against climate and other source information to try and explore human history. But as Alistair Whittle writes, the method tends to produce inaccurate chronologies of exaggerated duration because it smears results without precision and tends to reproduce the shape of the calibration curve. We can see that in the sort of similarities of the curves on the screen from the different areas of the ancient Near East. But more particularly, we also see modern inferences because if we look at the southern event, was there a demographic boom in the early Iron Age or was this rather perhaps the great interest and attention in the last several decades in the chronology of the early Iron Age in the region, which saw several different research teams produce hundreds of radiocarbon dates to try and address this. 
So maybe what we really need to do is try and focus on the human topics that enable us to extract signal from noise. So first, let's consider some tree rings. Here are tree ring information on precipitation or rainfall from Anatolia and the Aegean on top right, which we see a lot of high frequency signal. So from wet upwards, dry downwards, and it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. But we know from ethnography and history that this is what farmers expect. We know from Paul Halstead's work that farmers expected regular bad years, and they had a strategy typically that tried to enable them to ride out one bad year. Peter Garnsey's work similarly identified that the frequency of an annual food you know, crisis or problem was quite common, but it was very rare to have two or more consecutive back-to-back -back bad years, and thus there was an infrequency of real long-term famine. How infrequent and how relevant? Well, if we look at the period that we have tree rings from the pre-modern era, so before the mid-18th century, there's actually only one period at the beginning of the 17th century in which we have this sort of consecutive back-to-back -back bad years that creates a real regional crisis. So like in 1607 to 1611, we can see from the Old World Drought Atlas, the Cook et al., there was a major regional drought affecting the Ottoman Empire, but it's the only time in all of this period of several centuries it correlates with the Jalali Rebellion. <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily explain the Jalali Rebellion, but it perhaps provides a climate background that will have promoted the social, economic, political factors that led to this. If we consider the chronology, take the example of the late woodland period in the Mohawk Valley in New York State. Here we have a lot of radiocarbon dates now. And if we do a sum probability distribution, we'll just look at them as individual calibrated results on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a lot of dating probability in the mid-15th to the mid-17th centuries CE. Is this a demographic boom? What's going on? Can we get any resolution? Well, the only way of actually resolving this usefully is, of course, to return to the archaeological information itself. The site histories and looking at the stratigraphy to try and figure out the sequences within each of the site histories and looking at the samples, short-lived, long-lived, whether you've got bark edge giving cutting dates, do you have tree ring sequences enabling wiggle matches to cutting dates, to come up with individual site histories, that breaks down that same information on the left into the set of site periods on the bottom right, which are quite different. And most particularly, rather than having that apparent demographic boom in the mid 15th and 17th centuries, we see that in fact, we have separate sites which have therefore relations with each other potentially. And some periods of the question marks are, but perhaps we're actually currently missing information on sites that have yet to be excavated or yet to be dated. A very different type of resolved history. Thank you very much. Hello. Ooh, oops, oops. We only need to watch it once. Let me move on to the next one that we have. Um, so as you see, as we progress through these videos, you'll note that everybody tackled the topic of big data in very different ways. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Jennifer Birch from the University of Georgia, who's an associate professor in anthropology. And her research seeks to understand the relationship between long-term human, uh, excuse me, long-term human history and the lived experiences of individuals and communities, in particular, the nature of organizational complexity and diversity in pre-Columbian Eastern North America, using multi-scalar approaches to integrate um, the recursive interactions between structure and agency in institutions and individuals. So her recent research has focused on developing high precision radiocarbon chronologies of northern Iroquois to advance and apply archaeological theories of processes by which discrete populations realign into chiefdoms and confederacies. So let me pull up that video. And again, if you do have any questions, please make sure to put them in the Q&A. Hi, I'm Jennifer Birch. I'm an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Georgia. My work is focused on the archeology span and history of Eastern North America, though my wheelhouse is really in Northern Iroquoian archeology span um, and specifically the late prehistoric and early colonial periods in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence lowlands regions of Eastern North America. And so that's what I'm gonna be speaking to you about in this video today. So when I was asked to contribute to this session, I wasn't really sure that I worked with big data in the traditional sense, but I suppose upon reflection that I do. No one data set that I work with is particularly vast, um, but when you start integrating all of these different data sets, it really does become what we might consider to be big data. So 
The kinds of data that I work with include radiocarbon dates. Um, my own recent project has produced about 300, but these then become integrated um, with about a thousand other dates for the same time period in the same region. Um, I work with a lot of settlement data. Um, because of the extensive cultural resource management legislation in Southern Ontario, Canada, um, we actually have nearly 100 fully or nearly near fully excavated Northern Iroquoian village sites, most of which are ancestral to the Huron-Wendat nation. Um, so within this sort of large regional data set, um, I work with a lot of site-specific data. For, for example, my dissertation site included 95 houses with 1,500 features and something like 150,000 post molds. Um, and similar data sets exist um, for these other 100 or so sites as well. Uh, one of the larger data sets that I also work with is ceramic data that my colleague John Hart and I use for social network analysis. And currently, the data set has codes for 230 sites, each site with a minimum of 25 pots, and altogether uh, more than 70,000 coded callers assigned to one of 29 analytic decorative motif categories. So, when we start putting this all together, this is where we really sort of hit the challenges associated with working with big data. Um, I work with a lot of legacy data. So that means bringing together data collected by different archeologists using different standards and various referencing systems. Um, access to these legacy data sets means accessing collections that are spread across multiple facilities, states and provinces. And then there's also the issue of assembling these data in ways that allow one to not only address the questions or problems posed by your current research, uh, but also in making those data viable for use in future projects as well. Now, in terms of theoretical challenges, as a researcher, and to be honest, as a human being, I tend to be highly skeptical of received wisdom. Um, because I've recently been doing so much re work redating sites and finding previous data estimates wanting, this is especially true of cultural historical schemas, but also extends out to larger conceptual models, um, such as assumptions about ethnic homogeneity and, and to whom to assign uh, certain sites. So this tends to make me predisposed to anti-categorical approaches to doing archaeology. And so sorting sites or material culture into one category or another starts to become problematic in terms of database design. So in that way, I actually find my worldview as an archaeologist to be somewhat at odds with some of the best principles of big data management, although I expect there are other people in this session who have been able to move past that problem. So what kind of information can we learn from big data sets? Um, the integration of all of this data in my work has really resulted in a complete rethink of the underlying historical processes in the development of Northern Iroquoian societies. This includes things like who was at war with who, at what time, the adoption or rejection of European goods and persons, and a host of other knock-on effects that have really destabilized what I thought I knew about Iroquoian history, but in interesting ways. Um, so in this way, big data allows us to challenge explanatory frameworks in the service of finding meaningful variation. And in terms of what this means for the future of archaeological research, I really think that what it all adds up to is being able to write better and more meaningful archaeological histories. And that includes making history out of archaeology um, for the descendants of the people that we study and working with them, as is the case in my ongoing collaborations with the Huron-Wendat Nation. Um, so thanks for the opportunity and enjoy your conference. All right. Thank you, Jen. Next up, we have uh, Dylan Davis, who um, at the time that he recorded this um, was a graduate student in the Department of Anthropology at Penn State. Um, Dylan is now a po postdoctoral research fellow um, who is funded by the National Science Foundation and hosted at the Climate School at Columbia University. Uh, Dylan is an archaeologist specializing in remote sensing applications and human environmental interactions. His work focuses primarily on settlement distributional patterns and their connections to environmental factors in inland and coastal regions. Ultimately, his work se seeks to further our understanding of how people interact with and are affected by their environments. So Danny, if you wouldn't mind starting the video, that would be great. My name is Dylan Davis, and I'm a PhD candidate in the anthropology department at Penn State. 
I'm very happy to have been invited to talk to you about my research and how it intersects with big data issues in archaeology. My research largely revolves around the use of geoinformatics to investigate landscape scale human environmental systems dynamics, uh, particularly those that are related to settlement and mobility strategies in the archaeological record. As such, big data is exceedingly relevant to my own research goals, as my work covers large geographic areas and often utilizes complex data types to understand the relationships between people and our environment. The data most often associated with my work are remotely sensed data sets, which include imagery from satellites and aerial photographs, as well as three-dimensional point data from LIDAR, radar, and sonar instruments. Additionally, I work with landscape scale environmental data sets, such as land cover maps and data pertaining to hydrology, geology, and vegetation. And I also work with temporal data about changes in the landscape and its climate over time. One key advantage of big data sets like these is that they provide nearly complete and universal coverage of the Earth's surface, unlike traditional survey approaches, which are patchy, expensive, and often miss things that are covered by unfavorable environmental conditions like trees, shrubs, and, and other things that obscure view. However, one of the greatest challenges for using big data sets like these is in parsing through this global scale information, which can be extremely time consuming and prone to errors when analyzed by hand or by multiple teams of researchers. Along these lines, keeping analytical protocols consistent between research teams is another challenge, as different people on, often analyze things in slightly different ways. Especially with image data like remote sensing instruments, Searching for patterns can be difficult to do in a consistent manner. In my work, I've tried to solve these particular challenges using semi-automated and fully automated methods that employ computer-assisted pattern recognition and machine learning to my study of archaeological settlement patterns. To give you a brief example of some of my work with big remote sensing data sets, I'm involved with a number of research projects that are trying to identify human settlements in parts of North America and Madagascar. In North America, I've been using LIDAR data sets, which are a type of three-dimensional imagery, to locate mounds in the forested landscapes of South Carolina. And to do this, I've used machine learning to help parse through thousands of square kilometers of LIDAR data sets to generate archaeological settlement information. The results of such efforts have produced hundreds of new archaeological sites across the American Southeast, which has subsequently permitted for a detailed spatial analysis of the various drivers of settlement in this area, revealing that native communities chose locations on the basis of elevation and the distance between neighboring settlements. In Madagascar, I've been leading similar efforts, but this time locating foraging camps in satellite imagery. Using similar approaches to those mentioned earlier, I've managed to incorporate machine learning techniques to aid in the identification of very subtle landscape modifications that are associated with foraging activity over hundreds of square kilometers with high levels of precision. The work not only helps to pinpoint where people lived, but also the effects of, of human settlement on the landscape as we can tell differences between archaeological and non-archaeological locations on the basis of how they have impacted vegetation and soil characteristics in the places that they are found. Subsequently, we've uh, used some of these particular data sets to then explore the drivers of settlement in southwest Madagascar, revealing a, a myriad of different uh, social and environmental characteristics that are effectively driving or pushing people away from uh, particular locations. Um, the future of archaeological research similarly will, rev will revolve around these types of methods employing big data. For example, niche construction activities can be identified on large scales to answer important questions concerning food production and sustainability and human environmental interaction more generally in different areas of the world. Finally, I just want to acknowledge a number of funding agencies who have been instrumental in uh, allowing this work to take place. Okay, one second. Very good. 
go. I'm back, you guys. Um, we are receiving questions. I do see them um, popping up in the Q&A section. I just want to acknowledge that we are seeing them. We're going to hold those questions to the end, but I really like this one. So um, I appreciate you putting that question out there. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Hannah Lau. Um, Hannah is a visiting assistant professor of anthropology in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Colgate University. And uh, when Hannah was giving this talk, she was also at Hamilton College at that time. And so I believe in your first screen, it actually does say that. And Hannah joins us today. So if you do have specific questions um, for Hannah or uh, for Dylan or for uh, Jen Birch, please feel free to ask those targeted questions as well. Now, Hannah is an anthropological archaeologist who studies animal bones to examine the relationship between ancient people's uh, animal management practices, the environment, and sociopolitical organization in Southwest Asia and the South Caucasus. So without further ado, I'll let her take it away from here. Hi, my name is Hannah Lau, and I'm a zooarchaeologist. I work primarily in Southwest Asia and the South Caucasus. In my work, I'm interested in using the tools of big data to better understand past people's social ecological systems by looking at how they structure their animal economies. Combining, for example, the records of individual animal bones found at archeological sites in different ways can help us um, understand and compare and tease out the nuances in how people used animals in the past and how those choices dovetailed with how they chose to organize themselves, to spend their time, to allocate their labor, to access power. Through my experiences working to combine data sets produced by multiple zooarchaeologists, I began to think about how to make my own research more usable to people who want to interrogate it to ask and address questions I haven't conceived of. I think this question of how do we create data sets today that can be useful to knowledge producers in the future is a really interesting and exciting question, but also a crucial one for archaeologists working in all aspects of the field to grapple with. So one of the things I love most about archaeology is how collaborative a field it is, right? It is a team sport where knowledge producers are working together to, um, to achieve a common goal. Now, sometimes we do this explicitly, right? The teams that we work with in the field, for example. Uh, but we can also think about this happening across generations and space and time as we all try and understand and flesh out what the daily life was like for people in particular periods of the past in particular locations. So this has always been a component of archaeological research. But the potential provided by primary data publication in digital formats and the increasingly sophisticated ways that we can mine and share data allow us to um, pursue more and more ambitious questions and increases the utility of each of our own individual research efforts. So I think that we can think of data sets published by traditional means, perhaps like bricks. We can take bricks from different sites or temporal periods and combine them in interesting ways to build new things, to answer new questions. But the potential created by big data turns these bricks into something more akin to bricks made out of many, many, many small Legos. Our ability to combine and recombine them in novel forms is exponentially larger. But in order for this kind of combination to be possible, we need to make sure that all of our Legos fit together. Uh, they, they need to have some standard size studs and slots for studs, things like that. So uh, in other words, we need to leave future builders with useful materials to work with. So, as I said, I'm a zooarchaeologist, and my interest in this topic developed from an interest in correlating and combining different zooarchaeological data sets uh, to tease out particular dynamics that were happening in one community. So I began this work as part of my dissertation, working closely with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Richard Kansa, to combine zooarchaeological data sets that we had both independently analyzed from one archaeological site, so different aspects of the same overall zooarchaeological assemblage. And the goal of this was to better understand the development of commensal practices within a community over time. So this work was interesting and invigorating, but it also pointed out how as the scale of our integrative work grew, so did the potential issues of reconciling different um, data sets. We were collaborating and working together under the best of circumstances where we could talk to each other about our methodological choices and assess directly what that meant for the comparability of our results and data. Um, so this brought me to the question of how we make our data sets useful to one another, what kind of documentation we need, how we can find ways to integrate quality control measures into our data sets so that they can be used by others in informed ways uh, when you can't have those kinds of collaborative conversations. Issues of data comparability and data production, such as intra and inter-analyst variation, are not new to archaeology. But the effect of these issues grow as we 
attempt increasingly ambitious syntheses. These are important points that we need to consider as users of data and also as producers of data. We can't yet know how someone may be able to leverage our work into something greater than what we originally envisioned. But I have some recommendations here of how we can leave them the best materials to work with. These include being transparent about our methodological choices. So for example, for a zooarchaeologist, that may be, you know, what are the different criteria you use to separate a sheep from a goat? It also means publishing detailed paradata with our data sets, telling future data users, you know, what are the resources I had access to? So again, using zooarchaeology as an example, what animals were in the comparative collection that I had access to? Uh, it also means creating means for others to assess data comparability from your data set wherever possible. Integrating conscious methodological choices in how we construct, report, and disseminate data sets will facilitate their work. It allows us to be good collaborators with future knowledge producers. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Hannah. Uh, next up, we have a video um, by Tom Whitley. Uh, Tom Whitley is Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Anthropological Studies Center at Sonoma State University. His work bridges the gap between academic archaeology and cultural resources management. He's been a professional archaeologist for 30 years and specializes in using computer and digital technology to understand the human past. He's interested in how we can represent, recreate, and model cognitive patterns and human ecology in non-material ways. From a research perspective, this means interpreting things like risk, energy management, productivity, and social interaction using both environmental and cultural criteria. From a cultural resource management perspective, it means assessing the significance of cultural and historical landscapes, examining location choice, for example, through predictive models, and developing digital approaches to public outreach and interpretation. So without further ado, take it away, Tom. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Whitley. I am Professor of Anthropology um, at Sonoma State University and also director of the Anthropological Studies Center. Um, Sonoma State is located about an hour north of San Francisco in the North Bay. Um, I'm an archaeologist and um, a lot of the work that I do is with large data sets. Um, the uh, kinds of data sets I work with are large um, landscapes, things like digital elevation models, LIDAR data. Um, I also work with uh, photorealistic 3D modeling environments. I work with remote sensing data, ground penetrating radar, um, drone-based aerial imagery, um, all sorts of data that uh, essentially ranges in size from several hundred megabytes to terabytes worth of data. Um, some of the challenges that I face in working with uh, big data sets is um, obviously uh, storage of uh, the data itself, um, a lot of times I store um, working copies of whatever I happen to be working on on my um, hard drive, but um, a lot of the large data sets I have to store externally in things like um, external plug-in hard drives. So at any given time, I have five or six external hard drives going. And um, uh, one of the issues with that is that um, external hard drives have a tendency to crash occasionally, so you got to make sure that your data is backed up in multiple places or stored on a server eventually at some point as well. Um, and uh, the software itself is also a challenge to work with. Um, I work with a lot of software like um, ArcGIS and um, large landscape modeling, photorealistic stuff like Terragen, um, 3D modeling software like Maya or 3ds Max. Um, uh, also, a lot of uh, mesh-based kinds of programs like uh, Mesh Lab and you know various other things, um, Cloud Compare, things like that. Um, so, uh, a lot of these software programs have a lot of steep learning curves. So, um, it's important for students who want to work with big data to get the training um, and go through a lot of tutorials and things to to learn how to use the software um, that can handle this. Uh, these kinds of data sets. And um, uh, some of the information that we can get from these big data sets that, that I tend to focus on are things that um, are not 
uh, the traditional kinds of archaeological material culture things. I don't focus so much on um, material assemblages, features, or site locations themselves, or even sites in the landscape. I'm focused more on intangible kinds of things, uh, reconstructing paleo environments, understanding cultural landscapes from the perspective of people who might have lived 20,000, 40,000 years ago. So um, these kinds of things are uh, what I tend to refer to as um, the dark matter of archaeology, you know, just as dark matter is a little understood part of physics and makes up, you know, a large portion of the uh, of the universe, uh, intangible non-material culture things that we don't find in the archaeological record, they make up, you know, a large portion of what people engaged with in the past. So uh, big data is one way of or big data sets working with big data is uh, a way for us to understand the cognitive landscapes of the past, how people made decisions, how they affected their environments, how they changed ecosystems, how the, the remnants of things that we see today in, in um, ecosystems and plant life and things that are not traditional archeological are the remnants of past human behavior. And, um, as we look forward into the future of archaeological research, I think there are going to be more and more um, researchers focused on understanding these kinds of large-scale intangible kinds of resources. And these are going to be important for uh, not only our understanding of the past, but preserving and uh, protecting these kinds of cultural landscapes and environments in the future um, for um, heritage. And um, so that, that's essentially a little bit of an overview, a quick um, uh, understanding of, of what I do with the uh, big data sets and um, some of the, the backgrounds that um, you can see behind me as I'm giving this talk are really just examples of, kinds of the kinds of work that I do. So um, that's uh, basically it for me. Thanks. Awesome renderings. Thank you for that. Um, I think that we can all be very jealous of his rendering skills um, when it comes to the images that we just saw that Tom produce. All right, next up, we are going to hear a bit more from um, Parker Van Valkenburg, who is at Brown University, that up right there. Um, and also his collaborator, uh, Stephen Wernke uh, at Vanderbilt University. Now, Parker is an associate professor of anthropology and his work focuses on the long-term impacts of colonialism and imperialism on indigenous people and environments in Andean Peru. Now, through the study of diverse materials and media, including architecture, ceramics, environmental data sets, and archival documents, he seeks to understand how relationships between people, institutions, and environments are transformed in the course of imperial histories, as well as um, how the strategies of survival and resilience that communities develop to deal with empires are passed down and reworked across generations. In the course of doing so, he strives to generate approaches that are widely applicable to the study of empire or empires beyond the Indian region and which will uh, contribute to interdisciplinary understanding of imperial legacies in the modern world. Um, and as a note, please remember, keep those questions coming. All right, without further ado, Parker. Hi, my name is Parker Van Volkenberg. I teach at Brown University and I am the co-director of a project called GeoPacha, the Geospatial Platform for Andean Culture, History, and Archaeology. I co-directed this project with Steve Wernke of Vanderbilt University, and we have a large team of scholars in Peru, the United States, and elsewhere who are working on this project with us. The problem that we're attempting to solve is that we all study polities whose geographic extent extends far far beyond that of any individual archeological survey project or excavation project. Geopacha follows in the footsteps of a number of other archeological projects that have attempted to gather systematic data from satellite imagery in order to study large scale patterns in site location. What's different about this particular project is its federated approach. That is, rather than having one single uh, set of research questions that extend over the full extent of the project, we have a series of different teams pursuing distinct research questions using a common set of vocabularies and attributes to record their data. The tool itself is rather simple. It is a browser-based tool that is based on the Corona Atlas project developed at the University of Arkansas. And you can see here that it serves up 
high resolution satellite imagery that's already freely available, such as Google and Bing and OpenStreetMap. And then we have a series of tools that enable users to tag individual sites using a restricted list of terms, a grid system used for tracking coverage, and then a series of editing tools that allow us to vet the quality of entered data at two levels. One, the level of individual re research projects, which I'll show you here in just a second, and then also general editors, uh, who are Steve and myself, who process and, and edit every single individual point. We also have the ability to serve up historic imagery like you see here, a series of ortho photos or ortho mosaics created from 1931 aerial photographs taken by the Shippey Johnson expedition. So this enables us to collect data about uh, the historic extent of sites and landscapes in Peru. So I mentioned this federated approach that we're using. There's a series of six different teams that have been working up and down Peru from the Northern Highlands and Eastern Slopes uh, down to the Southern region. We've covered so far around 180,000 square kilometers by systematically scanning through the high resolution satellite imagery and historic imagery at fixed levels of resolution. And uh, despite the fact that that's a great deal of progress, it still represents only 10% of the entire Inca domain. So we have a great deal of work left to do. And I wanted to show you just a little bit about what we've been able to do with the data that we've collected. One of the things that Steve and I both study is forced resettlement among indigenous people between 1572 and 1580 under the regime of Viceroy Francisco de Toledo that resulted in the resettlement of up to 2 million indigenous people. Now, despite the fact that we've got quite good data at the level of individual valleys and sites, we have not been able to generalize about this process on a more regional scale. So using Geopacha and also using another complementary tool called LOGAR. We've located more than 800 reduction sites and uh, published the results of uh, an initial pass through this data in the Journal of Field Archaeology in 2020. You can see the DOI here, uh, and I'd encourage you to check that out if you're at all interested. Now, um, what we see at the level of audiencias of Lima and Charcas, modern Peru and Bolivia, is that these reducciones were not evenly placed throughout the landscape. They appear to concentrate in a couple of key locations. On the left side of the screen here, you see hotspot analysis demonstrating that there's a, a good deal of concentration of these sites of forced resettlement around the Inca imperial capital, Cusco, and then somewhat around the Spanish imperial capital, as well as some areas to the west of Cusco itself. And we think that this population concentration represents not a Spanish colonial phenomenon, but probably the resettlement of indigenous populations by the Inca during a previous period. Another interesting relationship that we see is a very significant statistical relationship between the locations of Reducciones and the Inca road system, which you can see here. Uh, we've compared to five different uh, randomized distributions of points within the full extent of the Inca road system. What this suggests is that Inca infrastructure continued to have a major effect on the location of indigenous populations, even the colonial period. And that in some ways, the way that the Spanish colonized the Andes was not by completely remaking the infrastructure that existed there before, but by using the Inca road system and Inca institutions as key sites of transformation and intervention. They, they colonized the Andes in a, in a way, the way that a virus colonizes a host. So these are just a couple of examples of the way in which these larger scale data sets can help us get at uh, fundamental questions about the nature of empire out of our much larger geographic spaces. Now we obviously face many challenges. There are many types of sites that we can't see and many landscapes in which we can't work because of uh, vegetation cover. It's never been our intention to replace the vital work done by archeological survey and excavation projects, but merely to provide a context in which to better understand the types of data that we're collecting through those more conventional methods. Thank you. All right, thank you, Parker. Uh, next up, we have a video by Chris Jaswa. Um, Chris Jaswa is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and his uh, talk is together um, with Michael Price from the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, Chris Jaswa is broadly interested in how patterns of human settlement, subsistence, and mobility are influenced by changing environmental and cultural factors that mediate human environmental dynamics. 
In particular, much of his work focuses on how the distribution and availability of environmental resources, along with cultural factors that affect how people use those resources, influence the distribution of human settlement. Um, Chris has three active research projects on California's Channel Islands in uh, Cabo Pulmo, Mexico, and in the Lucas Valley, Morocco. And his talk today is uh, focused primarily on um, on his research in California. Hello, I'd like to start by thanking Danielle and Sarah for inviting me to be part of this session. What I wanna talk about is one of the limitations we often face as archeologists, namely the fact that we often have limited data sets or small samples and we tend to generally be at the whim of the archeological record. Today, I'm particularly gonna talk about how we can use measurements on modern samples, so similar materials, to try to refine our methods to try and maximize what we can learn from archaeological data. The example I'm going to give is going to be modern mollusk shells, namely California mussels, and how we can use isotope geochemistry to reconstruct both water temperature at different times of the past, looking at environmental change, but often site seasonality, two things that archaeologists have used quite a bit in the past. Traditionally, a lot of the methods that have been used have been intuitive. So for example, here's a method that's often been used of taking two samples per shell to get water temperature at the time of harvest, and then also get direction of change. This has been criticized by a lot of archeologists who now use a more uh, extensive sampling strategy, but a lot of those strategies are still tested against inferred seasonality using other archeological proxies. And today I'm gonna to talk about the benefits of using modern samples from known seasonal collection. In 2018 and 2019, I sampled modern mussel shells from two locations on Santa Rosa Island, California, Dry Canyon on the north side of the island and La Jolla Vieja on the south side of the island. I collected about 3,000 individual isotopic measurements from a series of shells from four different seasons. Uh, so from, from uh, each, each different time period representing one of the typical seasons of the year. And so we, my colleague Mike Price and I used subsets of those data to try to assign season of harvest to different shells. This is, these are the results of a random forest classifier in tabular form. Uh, up top, what we have is the reference for the different season or the different months that they were harvested that we know. But on the left, this is the predicted values based on the estimations using the classifier. This is for La Jolla Vieja Canyon using five samples per shell. You can see here uh, on the diagonal, green means that it was assigned correctly, so it largely worked, but there was some conflation with other warm weather months, so between August and October in that context. This is the principal components analysis, a, a visual representation of a similar pattern here with the different principal components and the different axes. Different colors represent different seasons. The dots represent assigned correctly. The Xs mean assigned incorrectly. You can see that there is some differentiation, although there is some overlap. Looking at five samples per shell for Dry Canyon, it doesn't work nearly as well. There's actually a lot of uh, misassignments, uh, particularly within the warm weather months and then also within the cold weather months. The same thing shows up here in the visual representation using principal components. When we then expand it to 10 samples per shell, you can see it works actually quite a bit better for La Jolla Vieja. There's relatively few misassignments, but it doesn't seem to go away for dry canyon. I think maybe the reason for this is the fact that the dry canyon shells tend to grow a little bit slower for different ecological reasons, which make it, makes it harder to differentiate short-term patterns in those cases. One of the things that we see is that it's actually quite easy or quite straightforward to assign warm from cold weather times of the year we're still working on trying to refine it to individual season um, in a way that we're a lot more confident with, which actually kind of gets to our eventual goal is that rather than just assigning season of harvest, we want to assign probabilities associated with those season of harvest to then have, have more um, rigorous uh, tests and rigorous uh, data-driven approaches to understanding state seasonality, uh, which will then allow us to refine our sampling methods for archaeological shells to try and maximize the results that we can get from archaeological data, particularly when samples are limited. As an example of this, here are a couple of applications that I've been working with recently. This is a one site on southwestern Santa Rosa Island, SRI 347. It's a really interesting site. There's about 30 centimeters of really dense midden, which you can see here, that date to between about 8,500 and 11,500 years ago, so largely the Paleocoastal period. It's a time period we don't know that much about, seasonality of occupation and mobility. And so by refining these season of methods, this site has a lot of really fragmentary shells. 
if we can actually become more confident in our methods and, and understand probabilities of assigning say seasonality using this large modern data set, that'll actually help us understand mobility and site uh, seasonality during the Paleocoastal period in a way that we can't from a lot of other sites, because this site is relatively rare, probably the oldest site that I would consider to be a permanent settlement site on the islands that we've found. Similarly, we can also look, once we understand seasonal patterns, we can look at things like ENSO patterns. This is, this is um, the water temperature data. This is a, a idealized or at least a long-term average of water temperature for the Channel Islands. This is Santa Rosa Island from 2015 to 2016, the largest El Nino that we have on record. We have shells dating to that time period. So once we understand those seasonal uh, fluctuations, we can then look at look for these anomalous events and therefore maybe understand El Enso patterns in the past from archaeological shells. Thank you. Moving right along. Next up, we have Jacob Sedig, who is at Harvard University. This on right there. Um, Jacob is a postdoctoral fellow and archaeologist in the Department of Human Evolutionary um, by uh, Human Evolutionary human evolutionary biology, I got this. Um, and his work connects ancient and modern genetics with archaeological practice. So we're going to learn more about his research now. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Siedig, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow and ethics and outreach officer at the Reich Ancient DNA Laboratory at Harvard University. Though my background is in field archaeology, particularly the Mimers region of southwest New Mexico, I've been involved with ancient DNA research since 2016. One of the things that's impressed me most about ancient DNA is the large scale of research project, from the millions of DNA bases studied from one individual to the hundreds of individuals from across geographic regions and time periods that can be studied in a particular project. In ancient DNA, big data can mean many things, from the size of the data files we work with to the 5,000 plus ancient genomes that have been published most since 2017. I'm going to give you just the briefest of overviews of the types of big data we deal with in ancient DNA, first being the size of the human genome, which is approximately 3.2 billion base pairs. Now, we don't work with nearly that amount of, of base pairs on an individual level. Um, usually, we're looking at several thousand to several million bases from an individual. But even with that being said, the raw data files generated for an ancient individual can be hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes in size. So co-analyzing dozens or hundreds of ancient individuals requires extensive and, and heavy computing power. Um, and most analysis has to be done in some sort of remote uh, research computing environment uh, and can't be done locally on a personal computer. Uh, to prepare, curate, and analyze data, researchers have developed software, most of which is free and open to analyze data. These include programs like Admix Tools, Smart PCA, Chromo Painter, Plink, um, and many more, though there is a pretty steep learning curve on some of these, especially if you're coming from an archaeological background and not genetics. Um, and along with genetic data, researchers incorporate metadata, such as radiocarbon dates, isotopic data, archaeological context. So the scale of the data that we work with in an ancient DNA project is, is really massive. So moving beyond data generation, management, and curation, this slide shows a map of all sites that have had individuals sampled for ancient DNA. It's clear that the majority of ancient DNA research has been conducted in Eurasia, particularly Western Europe. Archaeologists and geneticists need to work to correct this disparity so that other parts of the world are better represented and researchers have an ethical obligation to work with indigenous and descendant communities from these places, such as the Americas, uh, Africa, and Australia. With my remaining time, I just wanted to give a few really brief examples of how ancient DNA is amp impacting our understanding of the past. One example is with the peopling of the Caribbean. Um, so in this research, research that was published last year, um, researchers identified two large-scale population movements, one associated with the initial peopling of the Caribbean, followed by one associated with the spread of ceramics and agriculture. This type of research is pretty typical in ancient DNA, um, but with this paper, um, perhaps the most interesting finding was a new technique um, that was developed um, and applied to make population size estimates. Uh, interestingly, researchers found that pre-contact Caribbean populations were significantly smaller than most previous estimates. 
Another example from the last year um, is a paper where researchers used ancient DNA to study finer grain question about um, genomic and social structure changes in third millennium BCE Central Europe. And we can do this because we're able to identify genetic relatives and who is related to each other at an archaeological site genetically. And finally, I, I wanted to highlight some of my own research, um, which took a little bit of a different tack. Um, what I was interested in doing with this project was seeing how and if um, knowledge of genetic relatives can help improve um, radiocarbon date ranges. So the idea here is that if we know that two individuals are related, that means that we can build in constraints to the radiocarbon date ranges. Um, two individuals um, biologically that are related can't be separated by more than a certain number of years in their date of death. And so I applied this um, idea and a methodology we developed to the large global ancient DNA data set of over 5,000 individuals and found that indeed we can refine radiocarbon date ranges by applying knowledge of genetic relatedness. There's so much more I could say about ancient DNA, but I'm going to cut myself off here. In summary, ancient DNA research is fundamentally dependent on big data, and along with providing a new line of evidence for studying past populations, the global ancient DNA data set provides researchers new opportunities to develop and test methods for interpreting the past. Thanks so much for inviting me to present. All right, thank you. So uh, our last video of today um, is by uh, Vagish Narasimham from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, uh, Vagish is an assistant professor in the Department of Integrative Biology in the Department of Statistics and Data Sciences. His research is broadly um, interested in problems at the intersection of genomics, computer science, and statistics. In particular, he and his lab um, and his colleagues have developed scalable and efficient methods to make sense of complex large scale data sets that are being generated in the fields of human genetics and medical imaging. So without further ado, let's start this last video. Hi everyone, thank you for having me at this AIA lightning session on big data and archeology. span Before I start, I wanna acknowledge that this work has largely been carried out by Brianna Flynn, a talented graduate student in my group. And I wanna acknowledge that this is largely her work as part of her PhD and I'm just presenting some of these results. So I wanna start by first saying that there's been a hundred fold increase in the number of published intra-DNA samples over the past five to 10 years. And that intrinsically ancient DNA involves destructive sampling of bones. And we wanted to build a process by which we could reduce or minimize destructive sampling by predicting whether a sample would be successful or not after ancient DNA sequencing prior to the sampling being performed itself. And to do this, we want to leverage large sample sizes of ancient DNA uh, data sets uh, for which sequencing had previously been carried out. We created a data set all from samples processed using the same set of protocols. And we deemed the sample as successful or not based on the sample having at least 3,000 SNPs recovered uh, genome-wide after ancient data sequencing had been attempted. This is uh, an arbitrary threshold, but it's a threshold for which we deemed we could perform high quality population genetic analyses. And we were able to determine uh, other sort of critical portions of the ancient DNA process, uh, fidelity process, such as uh, authenticity and contamination and so on. We uh, built a data set of around 2,500 samples, 1,500 teeth and about nine, uh, 1,500 petrous bones and 900 teeth, of which 70% of both of these types of bones were successful after sequencing based on our metric. We connected uh, this, the bone information, the image information from these bones to latitude and longitude coordinates, which then connected to various environmental uh, information about temperature, rainfall, and elevation, as well as soil composition information from two separate databases. So with this, we looked at associations of DNA preservation rates as determined by average SNP count uh, recovered after sequencing with these various covariates. And we show that increased mean animal temperatures are correlated or associated with lower DNA preservation rates, as are wetter climate, climates. Increased carbon content is associated with increased preservation 
And of course, older samples are often more poorly preserved than younger samples. We also had information from imaging data. And to illustrate this point, I wanted to show um, a, a figure from Hansen et al. 2017, which looked at two types of samples, one that they deemed poorly preserved and one that they deemed well preserved, and tried to look at uh, whether poorly preserved samples would also result in poor ancient DNA recovery compared to well-preserved samples. We wanted to do this sort of agnostic or uh, human agnostic. And so we built a deep learning model to do this. Uh, our imaging data also comprised of having additional information from rural, rulers and bags and so on. So we built a deep learning algorithm to crop the data just to retain the imaging portion uh, of the, uh, the bone portion of the image. We built a convolutional neural network independently just on the imaging data and independently just on the environmental data with a fully connected neural network. And then integrated both of these, again, in a convolutional neural network. And then we use the, uh, the integrated model for prediction of sample success or failure. To add interpretability, we also made uh, a class activation map, which showed, which highlighted areas of the bone that were associated with DNA success or, or sampling success or failure to identify features that could be associated with DNA preservation rates. Here are the results of all of our work in a single slide. We trained two separate models for petrous bones and teeth, and we show that the integrated model performs better than having either the imaging data or the tabular data alone. The imaging data appears to be independently predictive beyond just having environmental data variables. And our overall success rates are around 90%. So we compared our model, our deep learning based model, with experts, anthropologists, and ancient DNA practitioners. And here are the results of, of that portion of our work. And our integrated model is significantly better than uh, a human expert across all different metrics we used to analyze sample success. So we hope that this approach could be used to minimize destructive sampling by prioritizing samples prior to the sequencing process uh, or the sampling process itself. So we hope to improve on this work by using additional information such as micro CT or other types of three-dimensional morphology information. We also wanted to integrate micro environment information such as cave sites or shell middens in the future. And we'd love if we had community integration where people would share their imaging data as well as sample success or failure uh, as part of their published ancient DNA, uh, as part of the ancient DNA publication. So we can integrate this and further improve prediction. And you can try this yourself from this link on the GitHub page and download our training models and use it on your samples. So thank you. Please email me if you have any questions or send me a DM on Twitter. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, so that brings us to the end of our videos and the um, sort of next section of today's forum, um, which is a discussion of, um, of the questions that you have, um, questions you may have of our panelists. Um, I just want to highlight that we have uh, Jennifer Birch, Hannah Lau, and Dylan Davis here in the room with us uh, that can answer your questions directly. Um, and of course, we also are excited to, uh, to have a Q time for Q&A um, and to address um, questions that you post uh, in, in the Q&A. Um, one of the um, questions that I see in the Q&A um, is more of a technical question um, that Justin Bailey um, posed, which is, are these videos accessible on the AI website? And if so, where? Uh, the answer is yes, um, it is. And uh, I believe Danny will be uh, putting this on uh, in the chat for us. Sorry, what, I thought that's what you were doing. Okay. You're um, totally right, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, they are um, they are available uh, online, and they will be in perpetuity. Um, the first sort of content focused uh, question is actually a really big question um, that Willika Wendrich um, posed right at the beginning of this forum, and uh, we're grateful that uh, that you posed this because this is something that uh, we've discussed among ourselves as well. And that is, uh, she wrote, um, I've always understood big data, in quotes, to refer to petabytes of non-structured and miscellaneous data, volume, variety, velocity. 
It is a way to use fast moving automatically generated data streams almost in real time and do a kind of analysis that is not possible in any other way. The examples today are the analysis of complicated and various data sets that are being combined, but are at the same time highly mediated. In archaeology, we should probably find a different term, for example, extensive data. Reactions? What do you think? And this could be for our panelists. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm happy to start off, though. I think that when we were um, putting this together, um, we wanted to leave it open-ended as to how people wanted to interpret what big data was, because I didn't want or we didn't want people to think like their data was not big data sets, especially in this day and age when we're incorporating new technologies all the time or utilizing big data sets um, as a part of our research. For instance, utilizing GIS and the amount of information and data and files that we're utilizing to create these maps and images in order to better understand the distribution of materials or where excavated materials are coming from. That's part of the big data, but that's only part of what we do sometimes. We're also integrating that with other complicated technologies too, like doing these isotopic analyses or doing DNA studies or compositional analysis on ceramics, lithics, what have you. Um, and they are also requiring um, intensive amount of um, technological skills, um, a lot of data sometimes as well, um, and new different platforms to um, manipulate, interpret, and integrate these different types of data sets together. Um, and I think that that poses a whole new realm of issues for archeologists to contend with. So while big data might be traditionally thought of as something that is um, dealing with just terabytes and megabytes and well, bigger data files, um, I think that we're having to deal with it in a new way now where it's not just these isolated things, it's so much more. Sure. So I wonder if uh, Dylan, if you want to jump in here, since you're dealing with some pretty massive types of, of data sets in your work. Yeah, so I think uh, to the to the question that was asked, I, I would agree that you know, generally speaking, when we think of big data sets, we think of just data that you can't store on the computer. It requires just massive amounts of space to, to keep it somewhere, generally kept on servers and things like that. Um, with some of these kinds of examples, well, I think we do have that. And I think the, the comment about it being very mediated in many instances, I think that's just a, basically a, 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 the response to basically how we have to prepare these data to even begin to analyze them. So I know, for example, in, in the case of, of my presentation, the work that I've been doing, there's, you know, global scale information. Um, we're, in the case of like LIDAR data, for example, if you looked at the raw files, those are not able to really be stored on somebody's single machine because you have tens of billions of these data points that are basically just a cloud form where it's, there's, kind of to the to the point of the comment there isn't a lot of structure to it it's not mediated and it's kind of all over the place and it's you know there's a lot of pre-processing to that data that's required before we can even start to interrogate it so not necessarily in all of these examples but i think for a lot of some at least some of the examples given here and some of the types of data that archaeologists are now using there is a lot of this pre-processing behind the scenes that isn't necessarily mentioned in these presentations and is not often discussed or even thought about in publications and presentations it's just one of the things that you know we it's like oh we have to do this it's experimental it's preliminary in order to even get a file that could be used to run for example the last presentation a deep learning model you first need to prepare all of those images in a way that the that you can even start to use it in some kind of form so I think within the context of archaeological big data, extensive data certainly could be another terminology that we use. And I think that would be a, a good maybe, you know, mediator between pure, you know, big data approaches versus the kinds of things that people are doing with data that have already been cleaned. But for most of these approaches, when, we, when we're dealing with these 
very large complicated data sets, it's usually requiring some level of, of mediation beforehand. It's not just starting that way. So that's kind of how I would uh, kind of think in terms of, of the discussion points that that question raises. Thank you, Dylan. Jen or Hannah, do you wanna add to that at all? Or there is a comment in, in the chat um, by James Newhart who wrote, if big data means that now, it's not what it meant 10 years ago. I would prefer not to use another term because the broader definition has been appropriated by louder, more prominent examples. Um, I don't know. I, I have to admit, I feel somewhat out of my depth in talking about big data in the way that um, the way that I think about sort of that, for example, the last presentation we talked about was talking about big data. And I think it's because the, the data that I work with were never intended to be big data. So all of the things that Dylan's talking about in terms of cleaning and preparation, um, see, it feels like that would that's a whole other job um, whereby I would either need to hire someone or clone myself to be able to do that with the kind of data that I work with. So, you know, for especially those of us who are using legacy data sets as opposed to um, directly collecting or generating data that can immediately feed very cleanly into these kinds of um, applications. It's, you know, it's a, it's a big challenge and it's something that, and I guess that we really do have to grapple with um, despite the constraints on time, funding and infrastructure um, for us to be able to do those kinds of things as archeologists. I would just sort of, it's okay to add. Um, I think like one thing that's sort of exciting about all of this is that the scale at which we can do this is the thing that's really changing, right? We've always been good at correlating a lot of different lines of complicated varied data. They're collected in ways that have different problems that have different social resolutions or temporal resolutions. So like in that sense that, that extensive components always be, so it can be both big and extensive in the way we're thinking about these at the same time, but you know, both the volume that we can grapple with and the ways that we can maybe mine it in an automated fashion is the thing that's kind of exciting and unique. And I mean, I'm not someone who's particularly proficient in technological stuff. So I don't know, I can't envision where it's gonna go, but that's the thing that's really, I don't know, I, I think has the exciting potential to it. To, to tack on to that a little bit, I, um, I, I think Barbara is in the audience here, Barbara Mills. And so I think that her um, Cyber Southwest project that's been developed in collaboration with com computer scientists is a really good model um, for doing this kind of work. Um, but I really do think it, it, it's something where we need to kind of think outside of our traditional archaeological problem orientations and solutions to those problem orientations and start thinking more transdisciplinary if we want to really play with like the big guns of um, big data, as it were. I was going to say that it was initiatives like Barbara Mills and um, Cyber Southwest, but also Parker Van um, Valkenberg, um, he created that geo um, cache site as well. It's creating these new platforms in which people can engage with big data sets too, in a way that hasn't been possible before. Um, that's really um, revolutionizing the field of archaeology now. And it's probably in the way of the future, we say at this point in time, without knowing where this is all going to lead. But I do think that building these Building these platforms for people to contribute, collaborate, um, this is going to be really essential um, for how we continue with the field of archaeology in order to address questions in the past, but also with the CFAS idea in mind, how it's also going to benefit societies in the future. And I know that these platforms are not easy to create. I do understand that. So we do have another uh, question in the Q&A, um, which is more in regards, I guess, to uh, sort of contemporary issues um, that uh, unfortunately uh, Parker isn't, isn't here because I think it um, mostly addresses uh, issues, the, the example of resettlement uh, in um, 
sort of ancient ancient Peru. Um, and that is an anonymous attendee um, asks if there are current efforts or data being collected regarding um, a resettlement for Ukrainians to compare to other forced resettlement in the same area from prior wars. And uh, I don't, I know that I am unable to answer that question. I don't know if any of our panelists or anybody in the audience um, has any kind of uh, responses to that, but I wanted to acknowledge Anonymous's question. I won't pretend to be able to acknowledge the question, but I will say that I think that what these big data sets are allowing us to get at is the kind of granularity that we can see in terms of present cases of resettlement and population movement and things that do play out on the order of, you know, like the small scale, um, as opposed to thinking about things in like, the, you know, the old school view of migration, how it's kind of, whenever I think about the way archaeologists used to talk about migration in the past, I think about um, like a like a child soccer game where you've got sort of everyone following the ball at the same time, uh, as opposed to the realities of how people move amongst within and between regions. So that's one thing I think where these sort of big data sets can help us get at the, you know, like the human scale um, of responses and movements and that kind of thing. Great response. I'm glad somebody could tackle that. Yes, thank you, Jen. Um, we do have another uh, question or comment in the Q&A, uh, this one by Sarah Kanza. Um, who writes, sustainability of these efforts is a big burning question. How can we as a community interested in big data work together to get more support for this work? This is not a technical side gig. It is a whole new area of often cross-disciplinary research that needs continual support. Any thoughts on how to support this work moving forward? More money, yeah. <laughs> and I think um, you know, Sarah. One of one of the key key things that jumps out to me is not just uh, the presence of resources, but the continuity of that. Um, you know, I think many of us uh, have been in situations where we have started research projects um, and have programs running that we spend most of our time just trying to find the money to keep people employed and paid in those positions. And as soon as you're starting to add um, sort of specialty knowledge and skills, uh, things like bioinformatics um, that aren't typically hired in anthropology departments or classics departments, um, you know, it, it becomes really, really tricky to do that. And so that continual support component, I think, is, is really crucial. You know, um, we can oftentimes get money to start a project, but to actually maintain and, uh, and keep these, uh, the infrastructure going is uh, particularly difficult. If I can piggyback off that again. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the same people who are involved in the Coalition for Archaeological Synthesis are also some of the same people who are behind Digital Antiquity and TDAR um, and are supported both by sort of the organizations that they've created, um, as well as the institutional backing for those organizations, um, like say Arizona. So um, that's sort of where like, you know, we have to serve as advocates within our own institutions for helping to create and maintain that kind of institutional support um, and think beyond maybe the traditional sort of sources of funding and, and thinking beyond ourselves as individual scholars, as opposed to being part of this network that involves both us, our sort of university institutions, and then the institutions that we've created to, to bridge them. And along those lines too, it's having initiatives like hiring clusters, for instance, where you're kind of like forcing people in other departments to work together. That's actually going to um, help this progress as well. Um, I know University of Georgia, they have a hiring cluster working with like anthropology and um, uh, marine sciences and a bunch and statistics and a bunch of other departments too, for the purposes of hiring people with like interest in AI technology and how these can work together and advance our understandings of the past, the present and the future. 
Yeah, and I think going off of that, like the these cluster hires and these interdisciplinary, you know, consortia and institutions that are established in certain like research institutions. I think that's a big help because it forces us to break out of this, you know, disciplinary shell that we're always working just simply with other anthropologists or other archaeologists or other geographers or whatever your field of specialty is. If you're forced to now work with a marine biologist that you never would have thought to work with before and now have to start to kind of think about, okay, how does what we want to do fit with what they want to do and what are the broader questions that can be addressed with all of these different skills. I think that's one of the ways that does improve the sustainability of these efforts because now there is more money there because there's more people involved, more people are interested. And if it's also supported by universities and museums, not just the you know PIs that have to apply for all the funding year in, year out, that now gives it a bit more of this, you know, grounded uh, effort that's not only the dream of one or two people, but an entire university or institution that is, you know, funneling money and effort to support these kinds of, uh, you know, agendas. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, in sorry, sorry, Danny. Um, in addition to that, uh, Sarah wrote in the chat, um, also getting these contributions to be recognized in tenure and promotion is, uh, is an important element because uh, depending on the institution, it can be more difficult to, uh, to make the case for, you know, it doesn't fit clearly into the, oh, the bean counting of publications or, or uh, you know, student evaluations uh, in, in, in many places. And I was going to say, and just to promote CFAS even further, I mean, they went about partnering with a bunch of different institutions, a variety of different institutions, in order to maximize the diversity of those people invested and interested in the CFAS mission and um, vision. Um, they even started in 2020 the um, University of Colorado Center for collaborative synthesis and archaeology. And that in and of itself has generated new positions for people to um, continue to tackle these very questions that we're dealing with here today. Um, so it's, um, yes, I know, another subtle plug, join CFAS if you've not done so yet. But I think that it is really important to highlight that as um, these new emerging centers are providing new platforms for people to um, continue to work on these issues. Yeah, Keith um, just put in the chat that, um, you know, one one is the one of the issues um, is that we generally accept the responsibility to find the resources to curate our artifacts, but the digital data also demand ongoing curation and it's often not dealt with at all or not worried about until the project is over and the budget is gone. Um, and it's uh, from personal experience, it can be very hard to to find the money to do a good job, and especially when you're dealing with international projects where, you know, you have multiple stakeholders in various parts with different kinds of infrastructures to make sure that those data are available to all of the stakeholders in perpetuity um, and in stable sort of unstable platforms is, is a challenge. Well, are there any other questions that we can seek to address tonight in this lovely forum that we have going on? Because if not, Sarah and I have our own question for all of you. So you saw the inaugural uh, version of the quick takes. And yes, we have some tweaking that we can do and work on some massaging um, to really get this up to snuff. I think it was a really good first session. Um, a little biased, but I'm gonna go with it. Uh, but that all in mind, we'd like to see the Quick Takes platform continue to grow over time and to have this opportunity for other specialists and presenters to give their own little Quick Takes. But obviously we need to change the platform in which we're doing, or the topic that we're tackling. Um, and so we were wondering if we could pull all of you, not a real poll, but just ask you, and maybe you could put it in the chat section, um, what kind of Quick Takes would you guys be interested in seeing? Thanks, Keith. 
Oh my gosh, I read thanks also for the pigs. That's where my Zoar uh, <laughs> mind went, Keith. And it was the plugs, but yes. Definitely check out check out the website um, for, for CFAST. Um, one, one idea that uh, has been floated in the past is to have more uh, site-specific kinds of quick takes or region-specific where you could look at um, sort of landscape history in a particular region um, over, you know, over time with specialists working in that area. Um, but it would be interesting to, to see if others have ideas what they would like to perhaps see in another session of quick takes. Another one that's been floated, and I'll just put it out there, um, has been a quick takes on archaeological methods, pure and simple. And you could have like quick takes on isotopic studies, quick takes on um, like but very quick five minute videos that basically summarize everything so that you can integrate these um, different quick takes into your classes um, so that you can uh, utilize them uh, for public lectures too. If you wanna be like, so I'm gonna be talking tonight but I have a quick little video to give a little background on what I do. And then boom, like have somebody else introduce it for you. So being creative and being able to disseminate these is another um, aspect of the quick takes platform. Um, so any other ideas out there? Teaching archaeology, yes. We could also do a quick takes on teaching archaeology, um, which would be great for like a field methods course. Um, or if you're doing like involving volunteers coming to a site, have them watch a couple quick takes on actually, um, uh, on the. I'm sorry, teaching archaeology in a different way. I gotcha, like the different uh, pedagogical approaches. What else we got? Anyone else? Just to warn you, you will be getting a um, email from us, a follow-up email uh, to gauge your responses and everything like that. But at that time, we'll also ask you if you thought about any of these ideas um, for a quick take platform in the future. And perhaps, perhaps somebody's out there who wants to do take on a quick takes for the next uh for the next conference of the aia yes we can absolutely help you organize that tell you everything that we know based on our own experience so if you do have interest in this feel free to reach out to sarah or myself we'd be happy to work with you help you along um otherwise i we had always intended this to be about an hour and a half, and I think that we nailed it today. Um, we would like to thank you all for coming. We know that some of you have happy hour to get to if you're heading out on the West Coast, or you have dinner to get to if you're here on the East Coast, or you're just somewhere nice in the middle if you're in the center of the States. Um, but we do thank you all for joining us tonight for this first Quick Takes um, session, and we look forward to seeing you guys at future Quick Takes sessions as well. And also a very um, uh, big thank you and shout out to, to Dylan and Jen and Hannah for joining us this evening, as well as all the other presenters who couldn't be here um, tonight. Um, it's your work that provided us the opportunity to have this evening and uh, to have these conversations. So thank you very much. Thank you and have a great evening, you guys. Take care, everyone. <laughs>